Welcome to the third video, or part three, of the Building Functional Web Services with Scala and HTTP Force Web Series. In the previous video, we built um, two endpoints allowing us to persist and retrieve recipes um, using an in memory uh, data store. Um, in this video, we are going to be switching that out with an actual um, database. We will be using Postgres, um, Quill as our abstraction library and fly away, as you see in the screen, um, as a way of automating our database migrations. Um, so the code is going to be in the same state as it was at the end of the previous video. Um, we are going to be, switch there. Um, we are going to be switching out the recipes in memory implementation that you see here with one that is built, um, that is driven by Quill. Um, we're going to be swapping out the this implementation with that new implementation, removing this, uh, making sure our specifications pass. So let's get started. Um, and from so from here, um, what we're going to want to do is add dependencies for Flyaway. And here are, are some notes here, so we'll be using these um, as we go. Um, but we're going to be pasting in dependencies for Flyaway and dependencies for Quill. Um, Flyaway is a Java project. It um, allows us to automate database migrations. Um, and I've used this library for a while now, so it's kind of changed, but um, at the end of the day, you codify database migrations and there are APIs around um, automating, you know, automating the execution of those migrations and other things along those lines. Um, I would definitely check out their, doc their documentation for more information. Um, for this video, we are going to be doing um, just kind of simple stuff, executing the migrations, um, automatic rolling back if things fail. So let's go ahead and look at their API usage. Um, and uh, we're going to need to have a dependency for Flyaway. Um, and we can go ahead and just copy and paste this into our IntelliJ project in our build SBT. So I was going to copy and paste this template here and then go ahead and switch out the group and artifact identifier. Um, and since this is a Java project, what we're going to be doing is also removing, making sure that there's only one ampersand. Um, as you can see with this other Java project here, there's uh, that single, and I say ampersand, actually it's a, that's a percentage. That's actually, yes, yeah, so that's a percentage. I always, I, my uh, ailing, ailing eyes are failing me here. <laughs> so let's go ahead and get dependencies now for Quill. Um, and here's their doc, this is their documentation. Um, Quill is a library that allows us to abstract SQL um, in pure Scala code. Um, and this GIF or, or GIF, um, depending on who you're talking to, um, kind of illustrates that, where we define queries um, around case classes. And then using a, a Scala, an idiomatic Scala or Scala or functional API, um, execute um, queries against a um, Postgres or other um, database. So here we're filtering persons um, based on name, and then we're mapping on those persons um, to return values. So you see here, there'll be an auto-generated SQL that reflects that, you see, where name is John. So, okay, so let's go ahead and check out their docs. We're going to look at the documentation for um, the Quill JDBC Postgres API, because we'll be using Postgres. So we'll go ahead and copy and paste um, those into our dependencies and then make sure we don't forget the comma. And then let's go ahead and refresh that. So um, now we have Flyaway and Quill resolving, uh, but resolve momentarily. Um, we are going to abstract or provide an abstraction for a Scala abstraction for the Flyaway Java API, where we handle migration failures um, in, in an idiomatic or functional way where we express the failure as an effect um, or express the failure through an effectful um, an effect aware API. Um, so that's resolved and look, so we're going to make a new package um, and we'll call that database. I'm in there we're going to create an object um, called migrations that in, that abstract out 
for our migrations API. So it'll have a function called migrate. It's going to turn an F um, effect wrapper is typed to sync. And I say effect wrapper, that may, may be the best way of describing that, but um, in a runtime implementation um, that provides an implicit conversion based on this um, sync effect. Um, so we'll say F and then we'll say migrate result will be our return type. Um, and that'll be what we get back from the flyaway API. Um, and then we're going to wrap the, you know, like I said, the Java API in this, in this um, effect. So let's go ahead and check out the flyaway API and see how they do this in Java code. So here you configure flyaway with a data source. So the, the, the BC URL, username and password, and then we invoke flyaway. Flyaway can return a, you know, that, that migrate um, result or, you know, idiomatic Java, it'll throw a unchecked exception. Um, so flyaway migrate, and we'll see that here. See that unchecked exception. So we're going to handle that. Um, so we're going to hit swap out the these default values for configuration that matches um, what we're trying to do. So here's my little cheat sheet or cheat sheets. Um, we'll swap this out. And so from there, let's go ahead and handle this. So since so we're going to translate provide a translation layer um, for this Java API. So we'll catch the exception. And we're going to make sure we're catching the right exception. So it's going to be a flyaway exception. So case flyaway exception. And then we're going to wrap both the results here, right? So it could be either an, an a sync of F. Or it can be a sync of F where we raise an exception. Um, okay, let's remove that comment because you don't need that. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to actually translate this into an API compatible with our streaming API. Um, so we can use this within our web server. So we're going to change this API signature a little bit and we'll say FS2 stream. It'll be an F um, migrate result. And then we're going to wrap this result in a stream. So we'll say F is to stream. And then we're going to eval an F of O. And then we're going to go ahead and plug this into our um, server. So let's check out our recipe service server. Uh, we probably could rename that for the purpose of this tutorial. I'll, I'll leave that here for now. Um, but what we'll say is as a part of our stream, we want to execute our migrations. Um, and pass in that type of F. If I spell migrations right, did I spell migrations right? I made it an object. So let's, or made it a class, let's make that an object. And then let's go ahead and import that. And so what will happen um, if that effect, the effect of the migrate fails on execution or evaluation of the stream, it won't actually build a server or start the server, which is what we want. We don't want to start our server with failed migrations. Um, the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to update our tests to use this as part of the initialization to kind of simulate what would happen if we actually run our server. Um, and since we don't care about effects as much in our tests, we're going to go ahead and evaluate our um, migration. And we're going to, we're going to evaluate our, our effect um, and handle it in a, in a non-functional way. So as you can see here, this returns a IO unit. And what we're going to say is we're going to go ahead and um, run it. So, so what this will mean is that um, as a part of the server initialization that our migrations have to run successfully. So um, let me check something. So I have an existing database running. Um, or I guess database server, um, it's Postgres on Docker. I'll be making a separate video on provisioning it. It'll, and that's gonna be pretty pretty quick, um, but that's already existing. Um, I'll update the documentation um, in the branch for this repository um, to include how to do that also. Um, but on this 
um, instance of Postgres, we're going to make sure that we have a recipes database. If you, if we already have one on here on this system, since I've done a little bit of you know prep for this video, I want to go ahead and remove it, um, and then we'll start um, clean. So let's go ahead and jump onto the um, running container that is running that Postgres image, and we'll jump onto it with an interactive terminal, and then we'll run uh, psql, and then we'll say if we have a database. We do not have a database for our recipe. So let's go ahead and create that. So create database recipes. Great. And let's connect to it. We have no relations, which is good. All right. Okay. And so the next thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to load our, um, the UUID OSSP extension. Um, that is going to allow us to interact with um, UUIDs and Postgres, and that's because that's and we use that's what we use our our identifiers. So great, okay, awesome. Um, so then from here, let's go ahead and run our test and see what happens and see if we can actually interface with our database. Um, we won't be running any migrations since we haven't defined them, but the idea would be that we're going to be um, incrementally adding the migrations, swapping out the database implementation, or swapping out the recipes implementation with database compatible implementation. And then going from there. So let's go and do that. Let's run and see what happens. And you know, and that's the thing. The test should pass from an implementation point of view because we haven't changed anything. Um, that being said, if our provisioning failed, the test would show us that as opposed to as opposed to us having to run the server. Um, and so as we see here, we have output around uh, migrations, um, zero migrations ran um, and no migrations are found, right? So let's go ahead and start codifying some migrations. So we're gonna go ahead and make our first migration. Uh, that migration is going to be creating the database table that will store our recipes. Um, it's going to have two columns that codify our type um, of recipe. Um, and we can look at that. So let's look at our recipe type and look at its current structure. A recipe has an ID and a name. Um, our, data, our database table is going to codify that. Um, so let's go ahead and we're going to real quick check the syntax of a migration because I am not, I'm going to get it wrong. Um, so we have an, a version prefix, um, this delimiter and a description.sql. So let's go ahead and copy paste that um, into our um, file name and the folder structure is going to be resources database migration and we'll say create recipe table and then we're going to um, shamelessly copy this because it's actually the same example um, and so first let me recipe. So we'll say create table if not exists. So we're going to repurpose this um, recipes. Um, we'll use an identifier as well and name and we'll downcase this. Um, UUID um, primary key default UUID Okay, and then from there we'll make a name with varchar of we'll say 250. Um, we're going to make sure that recipe names cannot be reused. Um, that'll be our product, our requirement from product for now. Um, let's go and do a little bit of formatting. Um, so that should be good. So now let's go ahead and run that and see what happens. And the hope is that our test, our test setup does the provisioning in the database. Um, and so we can see here that we ran one migration. We've created a, um, a new table, hopefully. So let's inspect our database and kind of confirm that. So looking at our flyaway schema history, we should have one table um, that uh, we just ran. And then the table is empty, but it's an ID and name. Um, so that works. So great. Okay. So then from there, let's go ahead and start plugging in some Quill. 
um, we are going to make a package object to hold our what in the cool world is a database context that provides an interface or abstraction to our underlying data store. Uh, we'll make a package object, and that package object will hold our Postgres context. Um, so let's look at the, the cool documentation and kind of review that. So here's our context definition. So we'll kind of copy the defaults here. We'll use snake case and our properties identify or prefix will be context. And I'll show you where we'll use that in a little bit. So we'll put that here and then resolve the imports. And when I say this, you know, I said the, the properties, so that's going to be these right here. And we'll put them in a file called application.properties in our resources folder. So we'll say application.properties. And then the context pre, pre, context identifier or prefix, I was describing is right here, context. Um, now, our the actual code context, which is driven based on this context here, is going to provide APIs for us to interface with um, Postgres. And like, you know, like we were looking at earlier, um, it's a nice fluent API around um, interacting with collections. Um, we are going to be making a collection or abstraction for our recipes collection recipes table and then interfacing with that. So what we'll do is we're going to make our own um, schema um, and then we'll interface with that schema um, to create and return recipes. So let's go ahead and then create our recipes um, database friendly or database implementation. Um, from a modeling point of view, there's a couple different ways we can go about doing this, right? So we can use the context of the package to drive the um, implementation name, right? So we say that recipes within a database is a aware, aware of databases. Um, this gets kind of confusing potentially from an import point of view. Um, we're going to go ahead and then use the name of the of the type to drive its intent. So we'll call this um, recipes oops, recipes repository, um, and this will be our implied data our implied repository to hold our recipes. Um, and we're not going to update our test. Um, thank you for the uh, suggestion, IntelliJ. Um, um, we could also do our recipes table recipes database, but conventionally most web services um, use this repository identifier. For now, we'll, and we'll, we'll stick to that. Um, we're going to implement our recipes trait where we have a type of F or to describe our effect where, we where it's a synchronous effect. And then we'll implement our behavior or really it's not implementing now, we're just kind of, you know, copy boilerplate code. Um, but we're going to go ahead and describe our schema. And then we're going to go ahead and import our context. We'll import the context here. And then from there, we're going to go ahead and use it. We'll call this recipes to match our name. Ooh, recipe. And then from there, we can start actually um, interfacing with it. Um, so for now, what's going to happen, um, these are going to be unimplemented. So let's actually test this out. Um, we still need to actually sw swap out our, our implementation. So let's go to our trait, and then let's go to the impl. And we'll see where this is used. Okay, and so we're going to go ahead and remove those usages. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use our recipes repository. Ooh. Import that. And the effect is driven based in context. Um, we'll copy paste this for our tests. And now we've updated our underlying implementation. So now if we run this, run our spec. Oh, let's swap out F for our IO for our test context. 
and then let's go ahead and run our specific specifications let's see what happens oh, okay let's remove that on use import Now all our tests gloriously fail, right? And that's because we haven't provided an implementation um, for our, you know, copy pasted boilerplate. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, we're going to use the this the Quill cool API to insert our recipe name, and then return its identifier, and then wrap that um, in an effect of f, a synchronous effect of f with either a left or right, depending on our result. So um, let's look at a little bit of the code examples um, to kind of drive how this is going to look. Um, and let's look at, we'll do a search for insert, where we're doing an action of insert. Um, and where we're lifting or escaping our um, values. Um, since our recipe identifier is not defined, we're going to need to ignore that um, for the insert. And then we're going to return that on the result and then run the that uh, and then the API will be defining the quoted expression and then running that in our context. Um, so let's come here. And then what we'll say is, we'll swap this out for recipe again. And then what we'll do is actually um, import recipe. And then what we'll say is recipe, the recipe name is going to be the provided recipe name. Um, and so then from there, we're going to run this against our context. So we'll say context run. And then what we'll do in the query, we'll say that we want to return the recipe identifier. And then if we look at this type, it's going to be an optional UUID. Um, so let's go ahead and then update our method, our return to, uh, let's define a return type of F either you know, message or recipe. So what we'll do is map over this value. Well, actually, let's take this back. So what we're going to do is because we want these this to be a synchronous effect. Um, what we'll say is sync of f, and then we're going to um, do a delayed computation here. Um, so we evaluate evaluate the effect when it's actually evaluated. Um, so here we're just describing the effect of creating the recipe. Um, and what we'll say is that, well, we can map, well, so we could either map or match on some or none, or we can map on the sum value and then return or else, you know, the left. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, and so we can do map, um, a couple different ways we can do this. So let's say, let's do, and we can kind of walk through that. So we'll say UUID equals. And the UID, UUID is the, re, the returned UUID. Um, and then we'll say write recipe copy ID equals sum UUID. Um, um, and then we can say get or else left recipe. Um, let's do this actually. So import recipe message recipe message, and then we have the error here. Um, that's when we're doing that. We could also uh, match as well. Um, so it kind of depends on how we want to do this. So from here, we're also going to want it to define how we're actually finding our recipes. So let's go ahead and um, implement that. Um, and so what we'll do is we're going to say query our recipes and also, let's, I'm not actually using the schema, so let's update that. And so then let's say our, we'll use that context here, our recipes, where we filter our recipes for an identifier that contains our um, identifier. So we'll go, we're going to go ahead and make an, a UUID version of our ID. Of our ID. Um, and one could argue that the inner, the interface here, the method signature should drive the type. Um, and I think that'd be a good argument to make. And this is kind of code driven off of the previous iterations. And so we can address that in a subsequent um, iteration. But for here, we'll do the translations um, here, just declarative code. 
um, or imperative code. So we'll say value ID ID equals UID from string ID. And then now we should have a UUID. And if you recall from the previous video, we, we have specific checks around the type failure if the user provides an in, incorrect invalid UUID. So we're gonna have to specifically handle that here. So we'll and we'll do that incrementally as our specifications tell us to. Um, and so then from there we'll this is our query. Um, and we're gonna have then basically a list of recipes that matches filter. Um, and then we'll want to handle that because we would expect only one identifier. Um, so we'll say sync f another delayed computation um, or delayed effect um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to match um, on the list so we can say that we have um, a single recipe we'll say that we have um, recipes um, or we'll say that we have uh, no recipes and then we can all handle this. So we can say on an instance that we have a recipe, we want to return it. In the instance that we have um, no recipes or no recipes, we want to handle that um, with an error. And then the instance that should never happen, and we'll say actually see it's empty, I think. You know, that should, I think, I think what's happening is that the type here is let's, let's kind of check that out. So, uh, and then the, the issue here is that we're not actually evaluating it. So it's, or we're not driving, we're not providing the query to our context. Uh, so let's fix that. There we go. That's a little bit better, right? Okay. And so then from there, what we're going to do is we're going to then handle an instance where we have more than one recipe, which would actually never happen in real life. Um, but because of the, the way that our um, compiler is checking for unchecked um, or unhandled cases, um, we need to actually explicitly handle this. So uh, let's go ahead and do that. And now let's go ahead and run our specifications and see what happens. Um, let's fix that little time here. There we go. Okay. So let's run our specifications to see what happens because now we've defined an implementation for our database implementation. And then uh, you see that, there we go. Let's try that. Um, but now that we've defined a database implementation, let's see how our specifications look. So we have one test pass, so that was good. Um, but we had a number of tests fail. So let's go ahead and see what's going on here. Uh -huh. Okay. And I think we need to escape the um, UID. So let's do that. This is a very, uh, <laughs> very specific error message, right? <laughs> so let's try that. Okay, that's a little bit, a little bit better and a little bit worse. So, what's happened here is our test setup isn't actually taking into account um, the existing data store, um, and so let's go ahead and fix that. So you see, as we've evolved our application, our tests need to be a little bit more robust. So let's go ahead and fix this. So what we'll say under our recipe um, recipe name, we're gonna go ahead. And and make this a little bit more dynamic. So under creating our recipe, we're gonna make our name a little bit more dynamic. So we'll say um, foo, let's do UUID, UUID, random ID, and then we'll say, we'll call this recipe. Ooh, ooh. Okay, and let's make this a value that we can reuse later on. So recipe name, and that way we're checking for recipe the res the unique recipe name. You see here we're also checking for food as well, so that's not good, and we'll we'll address that incrementally. Um, so let's see how our tests look now. See if we can get one of our specifications passing. Okay, that's good. So then from there, kind of the same thing. Um, we have a unique error. So let's go to our next specification. 
And so here what's happening is that we are getting, we are creating a recipe where the name is not unique. And then we also check for the previous one. So that's not good. So let's go ahead and, and make this a little bit more uh, robust. So recipe name. And then from there, let's, oop, oop, oh, wait, hold on. Let's try this. failure here, copy paste failure. So, and then from there, let us update our specification here. interesting so let's do that okay two passing specifications um, so then from here let's see what's going on so we were on line 41 we were expecting a specific um, status and uh, we got a 400 so that's not good right so from here that request recipe id we got an invalid recipe so let's kind of debug this and see what's going on and we want to see what our repository does um, when it comes to these unexpected cases um and the thing is um you know, a couple different ways we can do this. We can go ahead and debug this. We can also kind of look through the code. So we know that we're looking for a non-existent recipe and the way we're handling that in the code is we're just returning an empty an empty message. But let's see um, what we do based on these lefts. So you see how we check for specifically um, this string and that was kind of the implementation detail of the in-memory data store. Now we can go ahead and drive our implementation based on this, you know, the specification informing us of the failure. So let's go and do that. So we'll say that if the recipe was not found, we're going to go ahead and have a message that tells us that the, the, um, the it, it wasn't found. Um, and that we will then use, um, that should plug into our existing um, tests. So let's go and do that and see what happens. Okay, so that passes. And so now we have this last one here um, about the invalid UUID. You see here what happens? We just have the um, effect, the object exception from the UUID from string API, and then it fails. Uh, we want to handle that idiomatically and then ha have our web server gracefully handle the error and then return that to the user. And so let's go ahead and do that. Um, see here, it's an unchecked, unchecked illegal argument exception. So let's go ahead and handle that. So we'll make a function called define from UUID. And then we're going to go ahead and handle that. And also too, like, you know, we can handle this a couple different ways for the purposes of this exercise. The in-memory repository, if I recall, had code that handle that. Um, we probably want to track this a little bit further up. Um, but for now, for the purposes of this exercise, we'll go ahead and do that here. So we'll say UUID string, and then we'll say option UUID, and then what we'll do is capture the exception. Okay. And then from there, what we're going to do is then convert that to um, an F of either, and then ha you handle that um, based on whether or not we get back a left or, or a right. Um, so we'll say from UUID, uh, ID, um, what we'll say is we're going to map on that value. Um, and then so let's do the map. And then now we have the scope here where we 
override the ID with a new ID. Oop. Okay, you see the ID is the UUID now. And then from there, in the instance that we did not get back an identifier, we're gonna handle we're going to handle that explicitly. We'll update that signature here. And then what we'll say is sync f pure left recipe message. And for now, just blank, you know, error message. Um, let's see, and let's see what our, if our specifications complain. And if they don't, we, we're going to want to update our test for that. Okay, and let's ignore the E because we know what that is. Um, let's run that and see what happens. Okay, so we expected um, this error message and we did not get that. So let's go ahead and update our implementation. And because of scope, we can just use the actual original identifier. So let's try that again. Great, so we have four passing specifications um, where we're testing um, creating recipes, receiving recipes, and the negative cases around non-existent recipes and recipes of um, invalid identifiers for breaking API contracts um, around the UUID as a required type of the recipe identifier. Um, we're now we are now using a actual database to purchase data. Um, we've actually corrected a, I think, uh, interesting um, specification that was not actually valid. Um, in this iteration of the code. Um, from here, um, I'll create a new branch that you'll have access to. Um, the description of the video will include a link to that branch. Um, I'm going to update the README with instructions on provisioning the Docker database, interacting with it. Um, the um, code will be on that branch that you see in this video. Um, please leave some comments, questions, concerns. Um, like or subscribe if you find this video um, informative. Um, I've had some um, positive um, and constructive feedback on some of the previous iterations. Thank you for that. Um, the next iteration of this video, um, I will be um, expanding out the recipes domain. Um, we'll have some more specifications around recipe instructions, um, and um, we'll go from there.